Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. These are the texts for Good Friday, which falls on April 7, 2023. Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 13 through 53, verse 12. Psalm 22, Hebrews 10, 16 through 25. And always every year, the passion narrative from the Gospel of John, verses 18, 1 through 19, 42. And I will just have to say how much I always appreciate going to uh, Seven Last Words Good Friday service and spending time uh, in in the midst of this scene, uh, learning from new perspectives of the familiar text. Um, uh, But what I'd like to focus in for us today is, um, you know, I like to talk about how we set things up and how we get to it. And this setup scene, um, in the midst of the portrayal is uh, when um, Malchus' ear is cut off by, by Peter. And um, I, I just want to, almost in a humorous kind of way, uh, say um, how this forgotten character, because we always talk about Peter, but, but how this forgotten character would have been somebody who testified to the miraculous work of Jesus because he's got a a wounded ear that for the rest of his life, he gets to say, let me tell you about how I got this scar. You heard about this guy, Jesus. (laughs) Or every single party, everybody's like, Malchus, Malchus, come (laughs) show her your ear. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. How do you get to testify (laughs) who God is and what God has done in Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if I get one, one thing from John this year, it's, it's probably the, you know, after the, the drama of Pilate shuttling back and forth, Pilate trying to figure out how he's going to crucify this guy. And I think also keep the, the, the Jewish leadership under his thumb. The way that finally resolves is when he elicits this confession out of them. We have no King, but Caesar, which is chilling considering this is coming from the aristocratic class of, of Judea at at the time. Uh, It's essentially a kind of blasphemy that they're speaking here in this, in this moment. It's exactly what Pilate wants them to say. You know, you can see him rubbing his hands together. It's also, given where we are in terms of the Passover celebration in John's gospel and what's taking place, Passover, remember, I mean, this is obvious, but this is a a meal originally uh, performed and eaten by people who are fleeing from Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. And who are about to see God strike down Pharaoh's armies, humiliate Pharaoh in the process, right? That's that's the Passover. And so for that moment, for them to say, we have no king but the occupying tyrant, mm-hmm. right? The Caesar of Rome. It's mm-hmm. just, have you forgotten your history? Have you forgotten your identity? And again, John overdoes this and probably indicts more of Judaism than John should be. But at this point, I think the Jewish leadership bears some kind of responsibility in their haste to get rid of Jesus. And but you know, watch out how you how far you extend that. But it's it's brutal, especially when you think that the earliest, as best we can tell, or one of the earliest Christian confessions of faith is Jesus is Lord. Mm-hmm. And that word Lord is gets a bad rap some ways these days. I think people don't fully understand the original context of it. It's also an old word in English, and I get all of that, but Jesus is Lord is not fundamentally a confession. Jesus is God, a, right? It's, it's not necessarily a, 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 what is it, like a Chalcedonian kind of statement or something like that. If I, if my church councils, right? Um, it's primarily a statement of Jesus, the ascended Christ's lordship over all of creation, including over the Caesar. And so it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's at this moment, it's an anti-Christian confession. Yes. I want to be careful about how that gets used. I'm not trying to separate Christianity and Judaism in the first century any more than we have to, but it's, 
it's chilling. This is their choice at this moment. And uh, it, and so, and of course he's going to be a kind of Lord on the cross that looks pathetic or is maybe mm -hmm. not what you'd expect power to look like. But I would explore that a little bit, right? What does it mean to call a crucified man your Lord? Um, what does it mean to call a crucified God your God or your Lord? And, and toy around with that and think about the ways in which, if we're honest with ourselves, there's something really disappointing about this. It's not the kind of power we want. It will make it difficult to advance our agendas mm -hmm. and so forth if we make that Christian confession. Mm -hmm. That was too long. That's like half your sermon right there. Just copy what I said and make it sound better and, and move on. Caroline, you've been very quiet in a conversation about John's gospel. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, my self control is quite. Like, You're is, both wrong. You're both wrong with everything. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, what we're doing is we're, again, recognizing and honoring what we've talked about the differences and the particularities of this passion narrative. Uh, the arrest scene in the Gospel of John is, is really unique on many levels, and one could just focus on that and the, the way in which Jesus hands himself over as he promised. As the good shepherd, no one lays his uh, life down. He takes it, he lays it down and he takes it up again. Uh, so he's fulfilling his promises there. Uh, I could go on and on and on, but I will not. Uh, and then what you talked about, uh, Matt, uh, with regard to that really, uh, it's a moment of deep pathos that that's the choice that's made. Uh, and, and, and what does that, and to think about that choice within the context of the entire gospel with regard to how, what does it mean that God, the word became flesh and dwells with us, uh, dwells among us and, and all of what that, uh, all of what that means, um, throughout the gospel. And then this is the choice where I'm landing this year is the unique word from the cross in, uh, in, in, uh, 26 and 27, uh, 1926 and 27 woman, here is your son. And then to the beloved disciple, here is your mother. Uh, and, uh, and the group of people at the foot of the cross is important in John. And maybe that's a, a homiletical invitation to put people at that cross. And what do you see? Uh, and what do you experience? And Mary Magdalene, of course, will come back in the resurrection as the only one who goes to the tomb, the only, and but has also been at the foot of the cross. So she witnesses the, the crucifixion and then goes and finds the tomb empty, her really uh, double trauma. But what what is so striking and so poignant in John's gospel is the fact that his mother is there. And the last time we heard, from the last time we, her presence was made known is at the beginning of his ministry. And so she's the one who, she's the impetus for his ministry. She's the ones who, you know, instigates, you know, Go show. do whatever he tells you. Uh, they don't have any wine. And it's in that moment that his, his ministry begins. It's not his temptation in the wilderness. And it's not his baptism. It's his mother saying, go be who you are. And, and now she witnesses, is witnessing his death. And uh, and then the disciple whom he loves. And I think that's one, again, from a very personal perspective, that's one aspect of death is that it it a death, um, a death changes your relationships mm -hmm. and it changes your identity and it changes your sense of belonging. And and how is it that all of your all of your relationships then get redefined and reevaluated so that. Uh, I've talked about this before that uh, I, I now no longer have either one of our, my parents. And so uh, what does it mean that I'm no longer a daughter? And I, uh, and so that's what I'm wondering what's happening here. How is it, how is it that Mary, I'm, I'm not a mother, <laughs> but I can be a mother to the beloved disciple uh, and same with the beloved disciple. So um, maybe inviting people into this place of the reality of death, that how that, how that, re how that changes, how death changes your, your entire sort of relational system 
and 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 also how Jesus death does that too. Um, how is it that your that Jesus death and then resurrection uh, shapes how you view and understand relationships, but but fundamentally your relationship with Jesus and your relationship with God, and and what does it mean to what does it mean to belong to a God uh, who dies on the cross for us, who suffers on the cross for us, uh, and sees us in that suffering and says. Um, there are relationships that you cannot yet see that I can see for you is, uh, is the word from the cross I need this year. Yeah. And how so much of that gets complicated too, if these people are going to make the confession, Jesus is Lord once again, right. And, and other followers who are going to lose family mm -hmm. as a result. I mean, I think exactly. as best we can tell a big part of the early Jesus movement was about finding new households to which mm -hmm. to belong because yeah. New relationship. Uh, making that confession was was dangerous and would cut you off from family and from neighborhood and friends and stuff. Mm -hmm. Not quite as personal and heartfelt and you know, relational as what you were talking about, uh, Caroline. But but it is this true. Is what he us. does, he makes is, new relationships. And it is, and he makes new relationships. But it is true for us that making that confession is risky. Mm -hmm. uh, and it and it does put some of our relationships in jeopardy. Yeah. Uh, and. So that's that's part of um, part of what what's happening here. All at the foot of the cross is a is a complete realignment and re understanding of of to whom we belong, why we belong, and whether or not we're willing to confess that belonging. Is that part of the Lamb of God imagery for you as well? I mean. John wants us to see Jesus as the lamb mm -hmm. here, the Passover lamb. I think we mentioned for Monday Thursday, not a sacrifice for sin in, in Torah, mm -mm. but part of how God creates a new identity of people and mm -hmm. a new sense mm -hmm. of maybe obligation or connection once, once they're through the sea and get to Sinai. But mm -hmm. or is that and too much? Am I pushing John too far about this notion of Jesus as a lamb? And participating, no. participating in a new community and a new way of being in relationship through this, through this ritual, through through these events, and a new relationship with God. I think that works, Matt. Mm 